here with Paul Wheaton, the Duke of Permaculture. Thanks for meeting with me, Paul. It's an Thanks honor for having to me. Have you here? I'm just going to ask Paul a few questions before we head on over to our dinner event here tonight. So, Paul, before we get started, would you mind just uh, letting our viewers should know a little bit about you and the Wheaton Labs? Ooh, me and the Wheaton Labs. I'm bonkers about permaculture, and at the same time, a lot of my philosophies on permaculture are different from the norm. Um, I've got uh, uh, an eco-building design that is a little bit different, the Wafati. Um, I've done a lot with rocket mass heaters. What else? Where else am I different from people when I, as a permaculture guy? Um, I think that there are some people in permaculture who are cool with spraying OMRI certified stuff, and I'm not. Um, I, I have some different philosophies on polyculture. I have some uh, different philosophies in use of cardboard and newspaper uh, with uh, horticultural endeavors. I have some different philosophies about composting, like oftentimes I prefer to not compost. And then Wheaton Labs, I bought this property about three and a half years ago, and uh, I've got some things to try. Some, and, and we've got, I think right now, uh, there's enough stuff there that if a person comes to do the tour, the tour takes three hours if you don't ask any questions. Uh, but a lot of people do, so sometimes it goes six hours. Um, we have a program that's kind of like a woofer program, but it's a little bit more disciplined. And the other thing is, is that if you do it for 18 months, uh, you get an acre for life. Um, we have, we call it the Deep Roots Package. Some people buy a Deep Roots plot. Uh, outright, and then we've also got the Ant Village, where um, people can come and they kind of uh, rent an acre from year to year, and then some of them are like working towards getting to a point that they uh, are have deep roots. Uh, so we have quite a community, more than a dozen people up there, um, and we're hoping that this year will be another boom year. Uh, for for those projects. Just to swing back around, when you're talking about you're different regarding. Uh, cardboard and newspaper. I've heard you talk about before the adhesives in the cardboard or the um, inks on newspaper, etc., is leaching into the soil. Essentially, is that? I mean, there's more to it than that. Sure. I mean, it's it's kind of like, well, what? Look, you first, let's look at the newspaper. The newspaper is going to be made out of um, uh, woody bits. Right? You're going to get the lignans. I mean, there's actually a process where the newspaper can come out and be perfectly good by my standards for horticultural endeavors. But the thing is, is that they found that there's cheaper ways to mash that wood, and that's going to be using a variety of chemicals. And so you're like, well, what chemicals? And it's like, you got to have a, when you ask that question, you need a date and you need a location. Because different people that make paper will change their recipe for those chemicals like every couple of weeks, depending on stuff and what new stuff is out and whatever. What, and, and then like what they consider to be toxic or non-toxic or what they can get away with in their area, things of that nature. For any given piece of newspaper, it's almost unknown which chemicals they used and how toxic is it. Now there's some of these sites where they make paper, it's now a super fun cleanup site. And it's like, well, why? It's because of this stuff that they use to soften the lignans in the, in the woods to make paper. And, um, and then, of course, you know, you go from newspaper to cardboard, then you're going to glue these pieces of paper together, including the corrugation that's in the cardboard. And it's like, well, what's in that glue? And then so they're always quick to say, well, it's 93% cornstarch. So you could, like, eat it. Of course, I'm sure it's GMO cornstarch, right. and it's probably been heavily, you know, soaked in a, a variety of different pesticides. But then there's like, and what's the last seven percent? Once again, changes, and it's like, and how far they'll go is going to vary from location to location, from cardboard plant to cardboard plant. And again, you can make cardboard that would totally meet my standards, but that's very rare. And, and so when this stuff breaks down, it's, it's seriously toxic. And, and, you know, a big part of what I'm trying to accomplish at a Wheaton Labs is that seven years from now, I like the idea of taking somebody, I'm going to call this Steve. He's my friend, Steve. But poor Steve, Steve has cancer. And I want to take Steve, and, and the doctors have given up on him. Steve, you're going to die. Nothing anybody can do just get used to it. And I want to bring Steve over to my place 
and stick them on my place, and mysteriously his cancer goes away. I, I mean, Steve was told, Steve believed that, and when he was told that he, that he had cancer, he, he believed that there was a cancer fairy that flew through the air and found him and went, ding, you have cancer, and that's where it came from. I have a crazy theory that cancer comes from carcinogens, and not just the carcinogens that we know, but the carcinogens that we don't know. And so I kind of can't help but think that if they're changing the goop that they're putting into the newspaper and cardboard every couple of weeks, and for um, reasons like, oh no, we found out that stuff is really toxic, we're gonna back it off and use this other stuff, and then oh, we found out that that was really toxic, so we're not gonna use that either. I, I, I am concerned that there's gonna be a lot of toxic gick in that, and then we start using it in our horticultural endeavors that Steve won't, won't have his cancer go away if we feed him food that was grown with that toxic gick. So I wanna have something that's so pure that when we feed it to Steve and he's in our very clean environment, which we've been very anal about, far more anal than most permaculture people, then his cancer will just go away. Here, I'm gonna put Steve back where I found him over here. Yes. Right. May he rest in peace. <laughs> no, he's good now. All right. He's good. Go, Steve! So while we're talking about toxic gig, this is a good time for me to bring up a question I have for you that I asked Joel Salatin a couple months ago when I had the opportunity to interview him. And just to set it up for you, yeah. I am on a 10-acre property. We are surrounded on almost all sides by big hay fields. And right after we moved in, I looked out our back window to our house, I heard a tractor going by, it sounded like it was in our backyard. I looked out and I saw the sprayer attached to a tractor and it's just spewing spray everywhere. I went to the neighbors and talked to them and they said they were using a 2,4-D application for their hay field. Okay. Our, our long-term plan, we have thought about um, doing what Joel Salton wrote about in Fields of Farmers, basically leasing land from other farmers who are looking to get out and younger folk can get in. Um, because we don't necessarily have the means to purchase that land at this time. Um, also, we were thinking if, if we were to lease some of this land, it would likely cause a stop of the spraying. If we were using, instead of the neighbors using it for hay, they wouldn't have the need to be spraying the 2,4-D. But we come across an ethical concern of grazing animals, because that's what we would plan to do with it, graze it, um, on land that has been sprayed previously. Is there an ethical concern? And if so, how long, how much time needs to go by and what remediation would need to happen before we overcome that concern? All right, I'm gonna pretend that you're gonna ask a dozen different people. And so I get to give the answer I like best. And my, my answer is move, ditch that property. And, and it's like, I think that when people go out in the country and it's like, okay, I'm, I'm choosing to not buy my food at Whole Foods because I go to Whole Foods and it says organic and somehow I don't believe them anymore. And um, you can go to any grocery store that says organic and you kind of think, I can't help but think that they cut some corners. And then plus the people, I mean, you're, you're trying to get away from the, the people that are into the toxins you know the sprays and stuff like that um and and it's like uh, but now that's the people who manage the usda and and it's kind of like and and they also manage like what does organic mean so then it's like the organic standard is weakening and at the same time um uh the 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 regular the regulation of it is weakening and the peep the players in it are cheating and so it's kind of like you just want to know. You just want to know it's pure. You just want to know it's good. And there's going to be overspray. And when there's overspray, your neighbors are going to be like, there, helped you out. No charge, buddy. You know, but now you owe me one. And, it, and it's like, no, I, I didn't want any overspray. What kind of, what kind of fool are you? You know, and it, it's like, I would much rather have neighbors that like have values similar to mine. I mean, I I went through a phase 10, 12 years ago where I thought I was going to change the world from my place, which was surrounded by sprayers. 
and and I eventually left that for a variety of reasons and now it's so much better because I'm not surrounded by any sprayers and um, the people that I work with and talk to about my endeavors are all permaculture enthusiasts it's so much easier now I, I think I've been asked this question almost exactly about 11 times and um, there have been some people where it's like I can't leave this property for reasons there's all this stuff and and it's like how do we reduce it make the problem less bad and um, and I still I just I just can't think that I want to get away from that entirely it's it's just I mean, we could sit here and we could talk about 50 different things that you could try to do to make it less bad. But if even if you did all 50 things, it would still be really bad. Um, it's flat. So if they've if somebody's used persistent herbicides in another field, and then their soil gets picked up and moved over to your field and your property. Now you're dealing with persistent herbicides. And if you do an awesome job of building great soil, that's organic soil, then it floods and that some of it might stay and some of it might go. How frustrating. And then on top of that, since it's flat, then it's like you can't control frost pockets. You can't control like warmer spots and colder spots. So um, you, I, I, I don't know how many properties I've been to, it's on flat land and I say, Okay, first thing you need to do is put a mountain in here. <laughs> culture. Well, no, I mean like a hundred feet tall. Okay. You need some slope um, because if you've got slope, then you can control frost pockets. And of course, you don't want just your you don't want to be at the top of a mountain. You want to be at the side of a mountain. And so, there's lots of land around here that's going to be probably a hell of a lot cheaper because it's on a slope and they consider it, you know, you, you, you can't run a tractor on that and so therefore it's crap. But it's like, no, this is perfect for permaculture and I don't want to run a tractor on it. And so, um, and yet I want to grow like uh, uh, 10, 20 times more food on this land than what they grow on the flat stuff. So, um, I'm, I'm I know my answer is a horrible answer and you don't like it, but move, move, go somewhere else. There's, there's like so much other property out there where you're not surrounded by sprayers. And in fact, my frustration at trying to find property that's not surrounded by sprayers or, or you get onto the property and it's like, oh good, everybody around me is not a sprayer. And then like two months later, your next door neighbor that shares a massive border with you is like, oh, I gotta sell my property and I'm selling it to this guy who, you know, loves to spray. He's a sprayer, he sprays 10 times a year. And so now you're, and so um, I was very frustrated looking for land. It took, it took ages and, and now this time I took the extra time. And what I wanna do is to facilitate like 20 or 30 other farmers. Um, and so basically we've got 300 acres right now and, and it's a bit like, all right, each person gets an acre, but you also get 300 acres to work with. And we're surrounded by forest service land and you know, there's, there's even the possibility of going into that land also. So um, that's what I'm trying to do. The other thing is, is like I made a podcast relatively recently too, where we're talking about like people who have the dream to become homesteaders and all the reasons, and there's a lot of reasons. And um, they go and they find a, a plot of land that's great for them. It, it's 300,000, bank won't touch it. Uh, so it's, it's owner financed. And the deal is, is you put one third down and then you have a mortgage. So then they're still going to their yucky job and uh, trying to get their homestead going and do all their permaculture dreams. But after three years, they, uh, they give up on it. They're like, I'm burnt out. I'm sick of this. I'm just going to walk away and I'm going to go get an apartment in town and pretend like this never happened. So again, probably very depressing information. I, you know, and, and then the other thing I want to say too is like when I was on Mount Spokane, just before I left the property, I came to the conclusion of like, okay, I want to do 
all the things. So for years, I've been doing as much as I can, and I can see all the things that I want to do, or I, where I want to end up. And I realize that I won't be able to get it all done before I die. Therefore, I cannot do it by myself. And that's when I started researching um, intentional community. And, and I found out that the recipes that we have for intentional community are generally awful and they generally don't work. And so then it's like uh, I started exploring some of my own ideas in intentional community. And I think we're seeing some, some strong success. But of course, I also think that the, the real metric is that um, you, know, you can't call it a success until you've got people that have stayed there for four or five years. I haven't even had the property that long yet. So, but we do have some people that are closing in on two years. And um, I, so I think that there's the potential. I don't, I'm not getting any signals that they're thinking of taking off. So um, I think we might have a, a strong, good recipe. Because imagine what it'd be like if, if you're on an acre and you're doing like 15 cool things and your next door neighbor is doing 15 cool things and 10 of those are totally different from yours and you've elected to do bees and somebody the next door neighbor is like doing a milk cow and then uh, the neighbor next to them does cheese using the milk from the second neighbor and so on and so forth and and it's like there's this you know collaborative effort and it's like uh, I'll give you some cheese if you give me some apples you know some of that kind of stuff and somebody is like building the structures and somebody else is um, bringing in some outdoor coin you know um, uh, who knows what and, and, it, and you form a community of diversity since we probably have to wrap this up to get on over to the presentation tonight uh, I'll ask you one more question all right you and the Wisners Ernie and Erica are probably the, the leaning innovators in the rocket mass heater movement. Is that fair to say? Uh, Ernie has built 700 rocket mass heaters. Erica has written the book. Um, but I, when it comes to being, I've done some of the innovations. Um, I'm um, the pebble style guy and uh, portable rocket mass heaters. But um, I would not say I'm one of the leading innovators. I, I mean, there's. Uh, Peter Vandenberg, um, Matt Walker, uh, Tim Barker. Uh, um, there's there's a, a, a bunch of other people that I would say are are the leading innovators. So, but I'm up there. I'm I'm sure. kind of I hang with these you're, guys. I can talk about piece. stuff. You're a good mouthpiece. Okay, all right. I'm the best mouthpiece in the room. <laughs> you bet. So. A few years ago, maybe it was two years ago, I heard you talking on a podcast about um, trying to get rocket mass heaters to the point where the person who is kind of at the low end of the DIY scale can get sort of like a kit where it's partially made and you just kind of finish it off. I was wondering if you can speak to that, if there's any kind of development with that. Where are we with rocket mass heaters? I, I do think that when it comes to shippable cores that I am still the pushiest guy. Um, the other innovators are interested in other things. And uh, so like right now, uh, indoor cook stoves is a big thing. And all of them are like very excited about that. But yeah, the thing I pushed for for a long time and I'm still pushing for it, and we still don't really have a business that has, uh, that I'm aware of that, um, cause I've seen, and there's been some businesses that have come around that say we're doing shippable cores, but I did not like what they made. It's like it's like okay, we keep talking about how that's a problem and don't use that, and and they they're like it's a shippable core. Uh, no, no, it's really really not. Um, and so, uh, but we now came out with that four a new four DVD sets. So we have a total of eight DVDs out now about rocket mass heaters. And DVD three of the new four DVD set is all about how to make shippable cores. And I think that we go through five general styles and I think we may have made a total of a dozen shippable cores in the DVD. I'd have to go back and look at it to be sure of those numbers. But um, the, the idea is, is that we got, we, we have some strong winds that are what we call um, freightable cores as opposed to shippable. Like, like you'll we'll make a giant core and it's going to weigh so much that it'll you can ship it via freight, but not through UPS. 
And then we had some other ones that might do okay, but they're not the complete core. Um, and and uh, uh, then there's some designs that we put into the DVD that I think are going to be the big wins, but as far as I know, no one has attempted to make one of those yet. I hope that somebody builds a business that builds a shippable core that I can say, that one, everybody go use that one. That would be terrific. But we're not there yet. I haven't heard of one. I haven't heard of anybody doing that yet. Um, but you know, we did so much in that DVD, I hope it'll inspire a business to form. And if people want to get more information about where to get that DVD, is it for sale on richsoil.com or? Richsoil.com. Um, yeah, I think it's, uh, I want to say richsoil.com slash wood dash heat, I think is what it is. Um, but you know, I think you could just Google, uh, you know, like rocket mass heater DVD and it probably will come up somewhere.